and welcome to The Convicts Conversation with me, journalist Helen Fospero. Throughout most of the 80s, this week's guest was in my living room on our TV set every week. As a family living up north in Grimsby, we never missed an episode. Cleo Rockers shot to fame as the glamorous and gleeful sidekick of brilliant comedian and DJ Kenny Everett in the BBC One primetime programme, The Kenny Everett Television Show. These days, Cleo is queen of tequila and agave and has built a hugely successful and cool brand from the ground up. Cleo, thanks so much for being my guest this week. I have missed you so much seeing you in person. Helen, and I've missed you too. What gleeful afternoons we've had that just segue from a jolly lunch into a a dinner and then swinging from a chandelier somewhere at three in the morning. I do hope we'll be swinging from a chandelier at three in the morning (laughs) in the not too distant future. But you're looking after your elderly mum, Audrey, right now. How is she doing? She's in her 90s, isn't she? So how is she doing in these strange old times? She's dynamite. You know, normally our house is sort of groaning with lots of, you know, often, you know, cocktail parties and dinner parties and things. So we're just, you know, keeping standards up without the people coming in because, of course, it's a really, really, a really difficult time. And the last thing anyone wants to get is this virus. Oh, I'm not surprised. You've got to be super protective. I'd like to talk all things tequila and agave, but first, take us back to the 80s. I have such fond memories of you in the 80s. How did you first get your break on the Kenny Everett show? Oh, well, It actually really stemmed from being late for a ballet class once. uh, And and, sorry, that's my parrot. And I was um, uh, running across uh, the. That's your parrot. Yeah, I have a huge huge macaw, which is a long story, but was sort of adopted. um, And and he likes to let you know he's here. Um, What's his name in case he pops up again? What's he called? Oh, Max. Max. Yeah, he's Max. He plays football, he sings opera, he's fantastic, he's terribly clever. and really great company. Wow, um, cool. Max. So back to the ballet class. <laughs> I was late for a ballet class and there was a director who was coming to this uh, school, it was a stage school, to look for somebody to to be in an episode of Mr. Big. And this director is the fabulous Alan J. Bell who directed Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy and and a huge amount of things. Um, um, oh, what, uh, what the, the program with all the old men in the country. Oh, God, what's that? Um, oh, you know what I mean. I can't even think. I've got. I've got. Um, Don't you worry. You've been locked up for quite some <laughs> got time. A brain <laughs> worry. Well, it'll come back um, to us. Yeah. So, so you know, with the lady with the the stockings that fall down. Oh. Um. Oh gosh. Yes. Uh, oh. Oh, you can't remember I it can't either. Remember it. What? With the chat with the little beanie hat on and everything. Yes. yes it'll come back oh, to us. Oh, quick! Don't you there'll worry. be people cursing us. <laughs> um. So he saw me running into this class, came in and then went to the agency of the school and said, you know, we we chatted briefly and uh, said, yes, I'd love to be in your program. So he went through the agency for me to come and be in this program as a bit of a saucy secretary. When I arrived to film, it was with Prunella Scales, Peter Jones and Ian Lavender. When I came to film, I was in my school uniform because at the time I was only 14, but I looked you know, sort of older. So uh, I said, oh, so I thought you were one of the older students. Anyway, so we, I did the episode and, you know, I was telling him that I could never get parts for my age because when they wanted a 14-year-old, I'd go along and then I looked sort of 25 and I was you know, hopeless to get a part for my age. <laughs> so he asked me to come for lunch in my summer holidays that summer and he'd help me get some agents who could work for older characters. So I went along and I was, of course, I was in my civvies and the director and producer, the lovely Jim Moyer, who was head of light entertainment at the time, and Bill Wilson were in the dining room at the BBC and they saw Alan and I having lunch and they came over and asked asked me if I would like to audition for the Kenny Everett show, which they were going to be starting that Christmas. And I said, oh, yes, I'd love to. So uh, they said, well, you are 18, aren't you? I said, of course I am. So when I went to the audition, I wore, you know, my, you know, my mother's sort of fur coat and extra lipstick and I got it. And I was only ever meant to be in the Christmas uh, episode, you know, sort of one of the, the earringy girls being jolly in little outfits. But Kenny and I immediately hit it off and we got on so well, it just it just went on from there. Last of the summer wine. 
<laughs> they're all sh- last they're of the summer wine. At us. All yes, our listeners oh, are shouting last. I know of the wine. You fool. <laughs> me, you fool. Not I know. You. Fabulous. Yes. <laughs> no, me. <laughs> oh, so, 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 so yes. Last of the summer wine. You said that you got on so well with Kenny. Do you remember first meeting him and what he was like and what that sort of connection was like, Cleo? Because I know you were so so close. Yes. You know, I wanted to learn everything there was to learn. So any sketches and things that you know we filmed, I'd, I'd always go back into the studio and stand in the shadows and watch how everything was done. And at this particular moment, it was about tea time and everyone was on a break. But Kenny had his a major costume on with the cannons in the epaulets and the cannons had broken. So he had all the special effects guys trying to fix them and he was sitting there in this hugely heavy costume because it had all metal rigging. And he saw me looking at uh, watching everything in the corner and he beckoned me over and he introduced himself and I introduced myself to him and we just started chatting and he said, oh, finally, a fellow Martian. And, you know, from then on, that's that's how we rolled. <laughs> oh, and it's amazing to think that you were just supposed to be in the Christmas special. And of course, it went on for years. You were such an intrinsic part of that programme. And you were saucy. It was great fun. I think it's fair to say they probably didn't spend too much on costumes because you had very, very, very skimpy ones, didn't you? <laughs> no, yeah, but, but, but you know, the too. thing is, I mean, I'd never even, I have, you know, four brothers. I'd never been on a beach in, in a bikini in, in front of my brother. You know, so when I first put the costume on and I put my stockings and suspenders and I was always brought up to it, you know, stockings, a proper full complement of proper undergarments and never... To, to wear tights, it was always stockings. And um, so I, had, I thought, wow, the BBC, they're so proper, even down to the underwear. And I waited for the rest of my outfit to arrive and there was a knock on the door and they said, they, you know, we need you in the studio now. And I said, well, I'm just waiting for the rest of my outfit. That is your outfit. So it was a little bit, take a deep breath and walk out in this. But I remember thinking as though I was walking out in a full length gown, but it, it, nobody bothered. It wasn't actually sexy. It was cartoonular. It was happy and and funny and silly and there was never really any reason for anyone to be in underwear it just it just worked that way it just it was just funny and happy cartoonular is such a lovely word because it was cartoonular and Kenny was just so brilliant at the characters you know we all still remember those of us who were sort of there in the 80s still remember the dramatic crossing of the legs and him saying all in the best possible taste I mean they were iconic lines weren't they oh yeah and and, you know so so much of uh, you know what we did we'd we'd have um, you know ad lib things and things would be born out of a, a fabulous They'd gone to so much trouble to build these amazing sets. And, and Kenny go, oh, we're doing one sketch in it. And we'd go down to lunch with Barry Cry and Ray Cameron, who were writing the show. And we'd go and have lunch in a local restaurant in Shepherd's Bush. And we'd end up writing all sorts of things on tablecloth, sketches and ideas and things. And often we'd, we'd have to buy the tablecloth from the restaurant with, you know, half of the next series on it. <laughs> so it was fun. It must have been hysterically fun to film. Oh, One yeah. of my all-time comedy favourites, Billy Connolly, was a regular. Is it true that you always recorded his scenes at the it, end of the day because you laughed so hard when Billy was around? Yeah, Billy, Billy Connolly, we'd film the sketches at the end of the day because Billy would come and the whole, everyone would go, oh, everyone would be supercharged up. And he corpses and he just, he can't stop. And the whole studio would be shaking with people, either trying not to laugh, not to be heard, or, or just, just laughing and laughing. And we, it would take take after take, uh, but in the happy and most wonderful way and everyone would be just you know you'd c- come in the next day with your sides aching from the amount of laughter Billy is fabulous to work with I absolutely love him are there any sort of amazing memories or antics of frivolity that that really stand out that when you do take a moment to reflect you think oh my goodness that was so much fun I enjoyed it so much yeah the good thing was there wasn't uh, there used to be people who'd come down and make sure that nobody said anything too naughty you know <laughs> I think there'd be a, a naughty uh, barometer man that would come into the <laughs> <laughs> into the studio sometimes but I don't ever remember anyone saying you can't do that that's too dangerous <laughs> and we <laughs> and we were always throwing ourselves into the fabulous situations which now there's no way they'd let you do and we'd always be getting bits blown up and cut you know things you know but it was great we had so much fun doing it it was just like living in the cartoon you know when you're a kid I used to love the the original Flintstones cartoons, the original cartoons where they were all properly drawn. And it was just like living and working in a giant cartoon. It was fantastic. 
And Kenny was super talented. I mean, to be as funny as that and as natural as that and create all those amazing characters, I can tell there was amazing talent there. Is that how you felt when you worked with him, that you were working with a comedy genius, really? Yes, and but it was just sort of a normal. We got on so well. It was super interlinked with us. And we were, you know, looking always to for a little bit of extra mischief where possible to make everything as fun and as... He had no limits in a good way, in an in in an upward direction. There was a certain freedom if you work together with Kenny. And he was like that in real life. We we went around the world on a trip <laughs> and it was just, you know, in today's world, if you'd actually been filming it, it would have been um, the most fantastic, you know, sort of docudrama of us trying because Kenny wanted to be in charge. Leave the hotels to me, leave the trip to me, leave, uh, and I'll organise it all. And he did. You also had enormous amounts of glee with Freddie Mercury and Princess Diana, didn't you? Tell us a little bit about that and Vauxhall Tavern and Troubadour days. Yeah, Troubadour was was the bar next to the Colhern. The Colhern then was, because actually Diana originally, before she got married lived in the Colhern Court or something one, the, the building further down the road from uh, you know this particular pub which was I mean I, I don't think she ever went to this pub I have to say this but this particular pub was a very heavy leather <laughs> leather gay bar with, with and people would arrive you know it was a really serious all man kind of bar but next door after the pub had closed you could go next door and the troubadour you could have pots of tea, which obviously weren't filled with tea or filled with all <laughs> sorts of different libations. So you could have whiskey, wine, red wine, white wine, but it was all put in tea because of licensing hours, so all in teapots. <laughs> that was really fun. Yes, well, we met Diana on you know many occasions at charities and at big parties and functions and things. And she loved the show. She loved Kenny's show, as did Prince Charles. We used to do some sketches on the royal family, but just jolly sketches in general. She loved the show and she could quote the sketches too. And we'd meet every so often for a jolly lunch and she'd never come with any bodyguards or anything like that or any security. She'd just come in her jeans and a shirt and, you know, rolled up sleeves and we'd sit and and normally have a lunch about an hour, an hour and a half and swap all the jolly story. She loved knowing what was going on. And in the show business, of course, we had lots of mutual friends too. So she loved to hear all the gossip, which we always got first class information. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, we'd swap all the palace gossip for all the, the showbiz gossip, but nobody ever had to say anything. But obviously we never talked about it. We'd never mention, you know, our lunches or anything. It was just super private. So one day we were in the Bombay Brasserie in Gloucester Road and Kenya and I would always arrive a bit early and we were about to have uh, then at the time, Keir Royals were quite popular. But Diana came in. Oh, I remember Keir Royals. Yeah, do you remember? And uh, Diana said, yeah. oh, no, no, they do great peach bellinis here. Let's have a peach bellini. So we had peach bellinis. She didn't drink um, a lot, but we would sit and chat. Um, normally she'd go home after an hour, an hour and a half. At this particular day, she came back to Kenny's house in Lexham Gardens, which was halfway home for her anyway. And I continued to make champagne cocktails in the kitchen. Kenny put on the Gypsy Kings, which again was a real smash album at the time. And he had in the corner of his room, a really exotic collection of what I can only describe as sort of dehydrated um, Vegas dancer <laughs> feather dusters. <laughs> and when I came out, uh, when he, if ever you went into a room with Diana, the first thing she'd do if she felt comfortable was kick her shoes off. She'd always kick her shoes off. When I came out, they were both dancing around in his front room with the feather dusters to the gypsy kings laughing and having a good time so we were going to go out that night Kenny Freddie and I we were going to go out uh, as often we did to the Royal Vauxhall Tavern so the afternoon went on we chatted we gleed Kenny phoned Freddie who lived only about 100 yards away and said Freddie come on dies here we're going to watch the Golden Girls oh because I didn't tell you before we'd go out, we'd always watch oh, a recording of the Golden Girls. I love Girls. the Golden Girls. <laughs> I wish I'd been there. It sounds <laughs> so such fun. Kenny loved the Golden Girls. So we put the Golden Girls on. Freddie came over. We turned the voice down and we all did the, the characters with a different story, like, you know, being silly and just having fun and laughing. And Diana asked where we were going to go that night and what were we going to wear. And my brother had just returned from being a wolf photographer in El Salvador and he had a camouflage jacket which he'd given me and Kenny wanted to borrow it so Kenny said I'm going to wear this well Diana said oh well can I try it on so she tried it on we put on a leather cap Freddie gave her his aviators to put on we tucked all her hairs up in the hat and it looked fantastic she was taller than all of us by the way too so the jacket fit her 
superbly. And she said, I want to come too. And Kenny said, you can't come. He laughed at first, didn't believe her. She said, no, no, I want, I want to come. He said, he said but it's, it's a gay bar. And sometimes there's a big hairy men have fights outside. <laughs> and he said, and I can just see the headlines tomorrow. Future Queen of England dies in hairy gay bar brawl. And, um, <laughs> <laughs> and Freddie was leaning in the doorway of Kenny's bedroom, looking out at, at us where the mirror was, saying, oh, go on, let the girl have some fun. So we did. We all got in a cab, which Kenny had rung. She said she just wanted to come as long as it took to have order a glass of wine and huge amount of exhilaration, excitement. But also, if we thought about it for five seconds longer, there was a kind of dread we may be rumbled. We got to the Royal Vauxhall Tavern and it was really busy. We were early and it was really busy. There, there must have been a huge act on or something that evening. We got in and we bustled through the crowd. And of course, Kenny's show was huge then. Freddie always been huge. We knew a lot of people. Everyone was saying hello. And Diana just sort of disappeared. She looked like a really elegant, beautiful young male model, <laughs> long legs. And she just looked fabulous. We all got to the bar, nudging each other, laughing, ordered the drinks. We were probably there about 20 minutes altogether. By the time we got in, got the drinks and then got out again. And then we got in a cab, took her back to Kensington Palace. And she went in, still all dressed and everything because she didn't want the cab driver to know. And then the next day she sent everything round with the driver, all the clothes folded up with the note, you know, saying fabulous time. We must do it again. Oh, she used to sneak out of the palace quite regularly. It wasn't the only time. She'd go to, you know, burger restaurant in Kensington High Street and queue with a baseball cap and nobody did notice. You know, she, she could disappear she herself. She seemed such a lovely woman. Oh, and she was have been this amazing, amazing trust as well that well, um, you'd built up. I mean, that sounds lovely memories. Well, I never told and we never told anyone. Nobody ever told anyone. And it wasn't until 2012 when I launched my tequila and I was with Richard Branson. We were launched on, on Virgin Clubhouses and Virgin Air, Airways. It, we were with all his group, you know, all his team there. And it was some of his team that said, oh, Diana used to tell us this fabulous story where you all went out to the Vauxhall Tavern and the only one who told anyone was Diana. We'd all kept it real. <laughs> so I thought, OK, so now I can talk about it. <laughs> Claire, what makes me sad about that story? You know, I was a big Queen fan. I never met Freddie Mercury, unfortunately. I loved Kenny, thought Princess Diana was wonderful. But it's so sad that they're not here and, you know, that they all died before their time. Yeah. We lost Kenny in 1995 at just 50, didn't yeah. we? That must have yeah. been... Such a devastating time for you. Oh, it was all devastating. And so many of our friends, if somebody was diagnosed as being HIV positive, that was a pre-signed death certificate. It was just how long did they have left until they they died. So, yeah, it was extremely devastating. You know, and, and Diana had no idea she was she was going to to die. So you see so many programs and they always want to make her look super sad. And I know there was a very unhappy part of her life, but when we got together, we all got together to laugh. And my memories of her, her throwing her head back and laughing and laughing. And she was really quick witted and she was really funny and she was very quick. And we would laugh and laugh. And those are my memories. I don't ever remember her looking, you know, with her sort of what has now become very much her signature look. She was alive and light and shining and she was huge fun. I think that she would really, really like what you're doing now. You're a successful businesswoman. You have an amazing tequila brand. And what I remember a few years ago when you started it is I remember you telling me stories of you going from bar to bar with your tequila, yeah. talking to people with a little suitcase and trying to get it out there. And now it's hugely successful. So will you tell us the story of Aqua Riva, Cleo, and who or what inspired you to start it? It's very strange. It's nothing that I would have ever imagined would be a direction I would have gone in. It must be about 17, 16, 17 years ago. I don't know. I don't deal in years. So about that <laughs> long ago. Um, I was in Mexico. We're filming a little thing out in Mexico and staying at a small boutique hotel, which is really lovely. And there was a very elegant and it's sort of larger than life lady sitting by the pool. She was drawing sketches. She was on the phone laughing and she was in a sort of resort where with, with her jewelry and 
it was blowing, you know, sort of chiffon gown thing blowing as she sat. You know, I thought she must be the editor of Mexican Vogue. And she was about 65. And I kept seeing that she was drinking from these long, thin, fluted glasses. And I just thought, I wonder what she's drinking, because I saw her drink about six or seven. So I asked the waiter and he said that she was drinking tequila. Now, my experience of tequila is like most other people's, their first experience. And I thought, there's no way she'd be dead by now. So I asked him to bring what she was drinking. And when I tried it, I realized at that moment, moment, I'd never, ever had a real 100% agave tequila. So something just switched in me and I can't explain it. And I just had to know about tequila. I loved the flavor. I loved the way, you know, he felt and he drank proper and real tequila. And I, so I started to learn everything I could about tequila. And in 2009, the tequila industry gave me this fantastic award in Guadalajara about the knowledge and contribution to the tequila industry. And in 2011, I decided that I wanted to create my own brand because I wanted to create a brand that was really high quality and really affordable. Just because it wasn't super expensive didn't mean it wasn't fantastic. So that's what I went out to do. And I spent 11 months with a master blender creating Aqua Riva, which is my brand. And it's won all sorts of awards, including best of the best in the world's biggest tequila competition in America, blind judging. And I just wanted people to have the opposite experience where there was a tequila they actually really wanted to drink. And that was smooth. And that was just really well made so you didn't feel dreadful the next morning. That was really important to me because I like to go out and I hate feeling terrible the next morning. So if you really make tequila well, you can drink it and feel fabulous the next morning, which is really important to me. (laughs) And and me. I'm definitely going to try some. And I know that you still go to Mexico and you love being in the fields for the harvesting. I have no idea really about agave plants or anything like that. I know your tequila is made from eight-year-old, I think, blue agave plants. That's right. But give us a sense of what's it like in Mexico? What's it, what's it look like? What's it feel like when you're out there? It's beautiful. The, uh, my my tequila is a Highlands tequila and the soil is extremely volcanic. So it's all red and, and rich. So you can just you smell the sort of minerals in it. And agaves have to be hand harvested. There's no machine for them. And eight-year-old agaves are normally at the optimum time of their ripeness. And once you harvest an agave plant, it's not like a grape that you leave it there and it grows back. You have to replant and replant. So it's, you know, you really have to love the labor of, of it. And and everyone involved, every from the hemador, which is the man uh, who, and they're normally men. I haven't seen any female hemadors, but I'm sure they are. I've done it. It's fantastic. But from the hemador, Humidors upwards, the people they have, they feel very connected. There's nothing that feels so industrial about harvesting an agave plant. That's been really important to me. It's that that is really really clean. So mine's just made with the agave plants and the spring water from the you know it's a volcanic region, so volcanic spring water. And excuse my ignorance, what is the humidor? Is that the harvester? Yes, you'll see people in the field harvesting the agaves one by one, and it's really hard work. And you you, you get up early in the morning. I love to go to the field, so I go. There. You get up five, six in the morning, you start harvesting because it gets hot so quickly. So you, you have a good half a day until midday or just before just harvesting. And it's fantastic. And, you know, the agave plant is, is an incredible plant. You know, it's, it's sort of reverse photosynthesis. So, so it actually grows at night and it's really economical with the water it uses. It's a fantastic plant. It's a really magical plant. And they're using it in all sorts of different ways to administer cancer drugs and all sorts of different properties it has. It's, it's, it's really incredible. You're competing with some big brands out there, Cleo. What have been the biggest challenges that you faced from those days going around the bars with your little suitcase, getting people to try it, yeah, to getting into it's... supermarkets and now going international? Yeah, this is this is so strange because I would go from bar to bar with my suitcase because I knew nothing about how to start, uh, you know, getting my tequila out there. But that's what I did just morning till night until it started to get a momentum. Well, now uh, we're nationwide. It's the house tequila of TGI Fridays. It's its fourth year of being house tequila there. And in fact, TGI Fridays have now got click and collect cocktails and the classic margarita, which they have, which is just made with my tequila, my organic agave syrup and uh, pressed lime. Then these little bottles, you, you can buy them online, which is great. And they're pre-mixed in a margarita. So it's huge now. We know we're we're doing a huge amount of business and a huge amount of of customers. In the end, my tequila has you know true authenticity and through true provenance. And you know, as as we all know, brands out there of whatever they are, very few of them are of any ilk are, are privately owned with true authenticity. So that's a big, big difference. And 
in the end, people choose my tequila because they like it. And that means everything to me. And that's how we get on. And of course, you've got your agave syrup too, which is a, a lovely byproduct, really, isn't it? The organic agave syrup is in Waitrose and in Sainsbury's as well. And it's in all the bars and clubs nationwide. And to get away from any refined sugar, anything like that, my agave syrup is a single ingredient. So again, it's only the agave plant and it's low GI, gluten-free, it's vegan, obviously. And it's all these things which if you want to replace conventional sugar, this is the way to go. Naturally, it's a third sweeter, so you use a lot less of it. And Cleo, is it true that for your tequila label, you got somebody that you met on the tube to draw one for you. Yes, because when I started this, it's not as if I won the lottery or had huge amounts of spare cash uh, at all. It wasn't anything like that. In fact, I look back and it, it scares me because I'm not actually quite sure how it happened, but it's just by driving forward. My label is drawn by a young art student I met on the tube and he'd asked me to sign something and he had paint on his hands and I thought that he must be redecorating his house or something. I said, oh, are you decorating? And he said, no, no, I'm an art student. And he just looked so interesting. He looked like a young David Bowie in a, in a really thin little suit. You know, not, not thin, but I mean narrow. He was very narrowly built, you know, very elegant. And so I said, let me, you know, let me see your work and maybe I know someone who can help you. And so I gave him my email and he emailed his work. And then when it came time to do my tequila label, I thought, oh, this is an opportunity. I will pass to him. And I said, would you like to do the label? I said, it's got to feel like your first day of holiday and it's got to have a, a seaplane in because I love seaplanes. And so I said, please redraw it. And he did. That's how the label came. That's him and his girlfriend dancing on the wing of a plane. But he was a 17 year old art student, Jamie. That's so cool. I read a, a great interview you did some time ago about money. And in that Oh, yeah. interview. You talked about when you were 22 in LA and struggling to make ends meet. Yeah. What happened the night that your friends went out? It was several nights, actually. Yes. Yeah, so, so, <laughs> so they were all banking holidays, you know, so I'd, I was waiting for money to come from the UK and the banks. And it was September, their Labor Days. There were all so many holidays. Nothing was online. So you, you had to go physically to a bank. You had to go physically. And I didn't drive either. So what had happened was I'd actually been originally staying at the, the Beverly Hills Hotel, but I was stay, had to stay longer. My friends were, said, come and stay with us. Strangely, what I didn't say was that night I had gone out to a huge dinner. Uh, Deborah Carr, one of the real Hollywood greats. I was friends with a, a lovely guy called Edward Duke, who used to do all the PG Woodhouse things. He had his one man show and he was friends with all these people. And he invited me to come to this dinner. So I was at a dinner party with Deborah Carr, Robert Mitchum at the Beverly Wilshire, what's now the Beverly Wilshire Hotel. And I'd taken my, my case with me and I checked it in. So after that, I would go back to my friend's house and stay there. When I got there, there was nobody in. And so I waited and waited and knocked and waited and nobody came. And suddenly it you know, began to become you know, sort of three in the morning. And there, outside their house, they had stones. So I was able to hoik my, <laughs> my evening dress up and climb up to the, <laughs> the flat roof and stay up there. I felt sort of safer at that time because at that time also there was a um, Ramirez who was this guy who was going around murdering people in brightly coloured houses. So if your house was yellow or pink <laughs> and this house was yellow and I thought, oh no, I, don't, <laughs> I think I'd rather not be around the outside. I'll just go up just in case. So I waited and there was a pregnant raccoon also who jumped from the tree onto the, you know, sort of onto the rooftop there. And so we, we sort of shared um, this place, but they didn't come back for days and days. And there was an outside tap, which I could wash, <laughs> wash by. And, and I wasn't going to tell anyone, you know, you sort of feel a bit, well, how have I ended in this position suddenly? You know, and I, I'm not going to tell people. I didn't have a telephone. I had to walk to the corner shop. It was in Laurel Canyon and there's a, a shop halfway up Laurel Canyon. And I had a telephone. But that's, that's where I stayed. And my, most of my outfits um, were either evening or I didn't have a flat shoe. I only, I only traveled with slingbacks and mules. And if I had to go out to do anything, I just went out and they dropped me back. But I wouldn't tell anyone. I just felt a bit... I'm ashamed, but I just felt they're going to think it's really odd. <laughs> so, and I quite enjoyed it. The stars at night were great. And it was just, the, and the raccoon, I know they can be a bit feisty, but 
you know, she was absolutely fine. There's no, no problem. So I'd actually quite enjoyed it. You said also in the same article, which I enjoyed very much, you said that the money at times in the 80s was quite crazy for an appearance and all that kind of thing. What was the most extravagant thing or things you splashed out on? Well, I'm actually not a big shopper. I'd rather live my money. So I remember being with a gang of my friends and being able to buy tickets and buy the holidays so we could all go together uh, was always such a, a nice feeling that you could do it just sort of so don't worry about it we, we, you know the most important thing is that we all go on holiday together and being able to facilitate that didn't you release a lot of little birds too somewhere oh the, <laughs> yes that well, yes that's right i was in a marketplace in bali and the moment was I saw these cages crammed with little tiny birds and I bought as many as I could as I spent all my cash buying them all and then hired sort of little um, cabs and carried all these cages as far away from the market as we could get and release them all to open the cages and for the birds to realize they were free. They didn't just all fly out immediately. Some of them, it took them a minute or two to realize that they could actually get out and to hear them sing and fly off. And that's just that shriek of joyous freedom. Oh, it was just, just fantastic. And I just wished I could have done it with everything. But of course, that the argument is obviously you perpetuate what goes on. But Anyway, all those little birds, I hope some of them stayed free. Oh, me too. And your biggest money mistake, Cleo? My biggest money mistake? Mm, I suppose not investing in broadband. I had an opportunity in the early 90s and broadband, although it sounded like it made sense and you could see that was the way forward, it would just seem so far away that, you know, I, I wish I'd done it now. And also... Big money mistake, another one would be not having worked out my tax terribly well years ago and having to go, you know, and, and do certain television programs to pay my tax. <laughs> <laughs> oh, so I'm really good at my tax now. <laughs> oh, was that yeah. Big Brother that you went into? Because I remember Big you Brother, yes. Did yeah. you enjoy it at yeah. all? I remember you not eating very much in there. Was the food revolting? Do you remember? Yeah. Yes, I remember. You, had, you ate well, a lot no, of oats, everyone... I seem to remember. <laughs> yes, God. <laughs> How did you know that? Yes, I did. I, I lived on oats because everyone was, you know, everyone has their own levels of hygiene and people seem to be sticking their fingers in in food. And, and I'm really fastidious about cleanliness around food in particular. So I just thought I'm not going to eat anything everyone else has been meddling with. I, I know I'll just eat oats. And if I got up early in the morning, I'd be able to, I would get up early every morning and I'd be able to be some fruit. So I'd have oats and fruit. Lost over a stone though. That was good. <laughs> I didn't really enjoy it. No, I like people. I love people. I was it. Ken Russell was in there, Jermaine Jackson, you know, and I love the different dynamics of all the people, but they're editing 24 hours into an hour. They're going to edit all the bits that are going to get the most talked about. You have so many wonderful stories to tell. And I realise as we sort of wind down to the end of our lovely podcast chat that actually I haven't asked you anything about growing up. Oh, I'm still growing Audrey, up. Brazili Brazilian I roots. It. I know you're still... <laughs> I know. We're not going to fully grow up, are we? But, but what was your childhood like? And, and, we and you have got Brazilian lot. roots, haven't you, Cleo? Yes, I was born in Brazil and we traveled a lot, lived a lot in South America, traveled, lived in, in Greece, in Portugal, in America, lived, you know, from L.A. to Washington, New York. So we traveled a lot and um, and I loved it. And I think that's probably why I don't like buying stuff. I like feeling free. I like to know that. Any minute now, you know, I could do anything. I could go anywhere. I'd, be, I'd happily go and spend, you know, six months uh, sailing sailing around the Caribbean or the Greek islands. Or so. I, I would, that wouldn't bother me at all. I don't like to feel tied to, to anything at all. Freedom is, is, is king to me. So I, I, that's why I don't have, I don't own too much at all. And does mum feel really proud of what you've achieved? Oh yeah, my mother's fabulous. Yes, she does. And, and she like, it's, it's just the same, you know, there's nothing that makes you feel tomorrow has to be the same as today. In fact, the opposite. So it's a bit different in, in the lockdown, but I'm working really hard. And in fact, in, during this lockdown, 
I've actually expanded my Aquariva range. I'm actually launching now two pre-mixed Aquariva cocktails. So I've worked and, you know, don't stop working. It's good. I love it. You are absolutely fantastic, Cleo. I mean, you are always a breath of fresh air. And as you might say, all my particles fizz when we when we. But you have to, I think the important thing is you have to get up and continue as you normally do. Uh, maybe not a suit if people normally wear suits, but put an outfit. And at six o'clock comes, not every day, but most days I think it's quite suitable to get into a cocktail arrangement and have a cocktail six mark the time that's what happened in the big brother house i tried to make say let's dress for dinner because it's a way of changing the mood if you're not able to leave a situation and i think it's important to change it with your clothes and keep your standards up i think it's important for mentally to divide the day as well I think it really helps because it's like going out without having to have the cab fare. I actually bought this fabulous chair. Actually, I'm just telling you really quickly. I bought this fabulous chair. When you recline, it feels like you can imagine yourself in a nice first class seat in an airplane going somewhere. And then I put YouTube on at the late at night when I'm finished my work, have a nice margarita. And it's as if I'm on an airplane. <laughs> and you know, it's, it's fantastic. I can recommend it to anyone. Straight up, Set yourself up a little. Straight up margarita yeah. with a little bit of salt around the edge is my tip also. I'm going to get some of your tequila. I can't wait till we can I know. You have been a simply a wonderful ball of glee. And can we share some hangover free tequila very soon when all this is over? Yes. Well, you send me your dress and I'll send you some. Oh, no, I wasn't asking. No, no, no. I mean with you. I know you're not. I mean with you. How would you know my house is full of tequila? (laughs) Is it? (laughs) No, of course not. No, not so much now. (laughs) I'm just looking forward to seeing you in person. Thanks ever so much, Cleo. It's been fantastic to hear all your stories. And um, Well, thank you for inviting me on your throbbingly fabulous show you you know you always have these amazing guests and it's a, a complete honor to to be in your company and on your show and thank you so much and you know i adore you from edge to edge and beyond listen sending you an award lots of love cleo I'll, I'll see you very soon i hope see you soon thank you bye you've been listening to cleo rockers comedy actress writer businesswoman talking about everything from her friendship with kenny everett billy Connolly, princess diana to life as an entrepreneur and businesswoman with her successful tequila brand aqua Riva. i hope you've enjoyed cleo's uh, fantastic stories as much as i have she never fails to make me laugh and smile join me next week for another great guest and do tell your friends that you can download our podcasts at convex.podbean.com or search for the convex conversation on spotify and apple and google podcasts and on youtube take care i'll see you soon